What's going on, Packer fans? Welcome back to the Packaday Podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. Bring on the San Francisco 49ers. It is official. The Green Bay Packers will officially face the San Francisco 49ers on Saturday night football, 7.15 p.m. on Fox. I am sure Troy Aikman and Joe Buck will be on that call. Should be a fantastic matchup. Of course, a repeat of a week three game earlier this season. In that case, uh, Green Bay faced the 49ers on the road in that game, uh, but came out with a win. We'll touch base on more on that in just a moment. I have some other things I want to discuss in regards to the wildcard games, the Bears GM search, the Vikings head coach search. We'll get to all of that eventually, but let's start out with the main event, and that's Packers 49ers. For those of you who are either interested in going to the game or maybe just interested in what the weather is going to be like uh, at the frozen tundra of Lambeau Field, the temperature is currently set to be a sweltering two degrees at Lambeau Field on Saturday night. No snow or anything like that expected. That is That does not include the wind chill, so likely uh, reaching below zero with the wind chill and winds around 11 miles per hour. So while that wind will certainly make things feel a little bit colder, uh, it's not going to be something that's going to affect the, the kicking game or the punting game all that much, at least if the weather stays as predicted right now. But it will be a very chilly game, especially at night. And I can tell you from, from being there, you know, what, a, a few weeks ago when it was the, the night game and it was, you know, right around the same temperature and below zero, it was freezing cold. I was in the press box, but just walking to the press box, walking to that stadium, walking out, all of that, it was freezing. And, and especially on your way uh, back out of the stadium, it, by that time of night, it was frigid, frigid cold. And this is supposed to be colder than that. So it is going to be a very cold game at Lambeau Field one way or the other, even if it raises what, like 10 degrees over expectation right now, it's still going to be a freezing cold game. Uh, you know, as far as how San Francisco got to this point, 49ers defeated this, uh, the Dallas Cowboys, excuse me, 23 to 17, a six point victory. It certainly seemed at first like maybe the 49ers were going to make it much less of a game than what it ultimately ended up becoming. Cowboys put a semi valiant effort, uh, you know, towards, towards uh, trying to get a victory towards the end. But you just got to say that was an absolute train wreck by both teams to end that game. And it literally felt like both teams were almost trying to give the game away more than they were trying to win it. You know, whether it was Jimmy Garoppolo's interception that really started the the downfall for the 49ers, whether it was their inability to, you know, be prepared for a potential fake punt in the, that situation, whether it was, you know, giving up easy, easy yardage uh, to the Cowboys on that last drive up until that final QB draw, which we'll get to in a second. The, the 49ers had a lot of issues towards the end of that game. And if you go back to the second half of that game for San Francisco, punt, and then it was the touchdown following the turnover, right? They get the turnover and then they go like one play, 28 yards for the touchdown. On, I think it was a run by Debo Samuel if memory serves. But they go, they get the one touchdown and then they go punt, interception, punt, punt. A brutal second half for that 49ers offense in almost choking away that game. You know, when Jimmy G threw the interception, I felt at that point, if, if San Francisco just would have ran the rest of the game and never thrown another pass, I think San Francisco gets out of there easy. The interception was brutal. And then Dallas goes in and scores an easy touchdown and everything gets more complicated than that. Then on their next drive, they have a fourth and one that they don't go for. They punt the ball away. The Cowboys turn it over on downs and all they have to do is get one first down. And of course, then you have that large review and the ball getting placed back and you've got a fourth and in inches, right? And this is this is the first play. The two QB sneaks, the you know, they're the two QB runs are the two plays I really want to talk about here because let, let's start with the 49ers. Fourth and inches, and you, me, your mom, the 49ers, the Cowboys, everyone in that stadium, everyone, literally everyone knew that that was going to be a QB sneak. And I know that Kyle Shanahan is insanely creative and there's a variety of different things that he could do at any given moment. That was always going to be a QB sneak. There is no reason for any sort of eye candy. There's no reason for Trent Williams to go in motion on that play. If you want to move Trent Williams around and put him at left or right guard because he's the most devastating blocker in the history of like, uh, at least in current football, maybe not the history, Larry Allen and a, a couple others may have that, but he's one of them. He's, he's probably in the like top five to 10 of most devastating blockers in NFL history. If you want to move him inside at guard so you get more movement and can get more, uh, you know, you know, ability to, to sneak forward on that. Okay. But you are putting Trent Williams in motion on that play. 
you're just asking for some sort of weird mistake. That is not what Trent Williams does. Trent Williams does not go in motion and then he's not set and you have the, you know, uh, they call it a false start. I don't know it was a false start. It was more like an illegal motion, but whatever you want to call it, it costs San Francisco five yards and they have to ultimately punt the ball away. When you're, when, if you get an inch on that play, the game is over. Also, by the way, because you're not fooling anyone, Trey Lance has to be the quarterback in that situation, right? You need an inch. You have like a six foot six power forward at as a quarterback and you're going to have Jimmy G sneak it instead. Like if you want to move Trent Williams inside at that guard spot and just move people, put like use check right behind so he can push the pile if need be, and then put Trey Lance at, at quarterback. Don't put anyone in motion. You don't need to do that. Just line up and sneak the ball and you are an easy winner in that game. The fact that they did all this, I can't, in, in a lot of the second half at times felt like, you know, there's all this, you know, motion and eye candy for San Francisco. It felt like once Dallas just said, all right, we're not paying attention to any of that anymore and, and kind of got everything together. San Francisco didn't have anything else. And it almost felt like San Francisco outthought themselves more in the second half, trying to do more than they needed to at times. And I thought that was a major issue and something that's going to be worth watching as the 49ers get set for Green Bay or vice versa as Green Bay gets set for the 49ers this week. So ultimately you have the false start, they punt the ball back, and then you've got this weird situation from the 49ers where they're allowing way too easy of yardage in that situation. And as Troy Aikman, uh, or excuse me, as Tony Romo aptly pointed out in that situation, like you have to cover the boundary and make sure that you're tackling people in bounds. To give up 10 to 15 yard chunks and allow them to get out of bounds was mind numbing to the point where they get down to the, what, 40-ish yard line, something like that. And then the the play to end all plays, and as I joked on Twitter, the most McCarthy ending to a game of all McCarthy endings, Dak Prescott sneaks up the middle and gets decent yardage to get, you know, whatever was down to the 20, 30, somewhere in there. So they were going to have one chance, I you know, in an ideal situation at about a, what, 25, 30 yard play into the end zone for an opportunity to win the game. I can semi understand the thinking in that situation, but you have got to have that play mastered in order to run it in that situation. And I mean, there can be no mistakes whatsoever. You have to know it at the exact moment that you need to get down. And it seemed like Dak in that situation maybe went about five yards too far and didn't get down sooner. And then two, you have to know to get the ball to the referee. I know that there were quite a few memes online of how aggressively the ref came in. The ref's doing everything in his power to spot that ball as quickly as possible. He has to basically go through the offensive line, push people out of the way, and then spot the ball and then get back in his position so that you can snap the ball. And oh, by the way, probably not the ideal situation to have to count on the referees and the clock operator. You're, you're putting the game in way too many other people's hands in that situation. And if one thing goes slightly wrong, your season is over. So you might say, and I know McCarthy was adamant that it was the right call and things like that. It wasn't because, you know, maybe it would have been, it had, uh, you know, had you had that play mastered and had it not, you know, been in other players, you know, people's hands to make sure that the clock gets stopped in time. There are way too many variables in that situation to try to pull that play off. And clearly they did not have it mastered because if you don't know to give the ball to the referee, it's, it's over. It's absolutely over. And that cost them. Now, the odds of you know Dallas completing a pass in that situation and winning the game probably not the greatest, right? But you know it's not impossible. They certainly worked their way down the field and had an opportunity to win it if they can get one more playoff. But man, what an absolute cluster on both sides to end that game. And while in the first half you're you know you're looking that you know the the 49ers almost like a, a buzzsaw going through Dallas and how quickly they were able to work their way down the field. Their defense looked great in the first half. In the second half, it was the exact opposite. And there were a ton of mistakes by the 49ers as well. It wasn't just the Cowboys. And San Francisco needs to get a lot cleaned up as they head into Green Bay. I know there was some trepidation, you know, from Packer fans as that game was going on as to whether or not it was, you know, the 49ers that they wanted to see coming to Green Bay. After watching that game, and I'll watch it more, uh, you know, this week at some point, I, I didn't have a ton of concern. And listen, this... There, there's no gimmies from here on out. It's the final eight and every game is going to be difficult. 
But if you had to ask me, you know, especially if the Rams win on Monday Night Football, if you had to ask me to handpick the the team that you would most want to play of the remaining seven that aren't named Green Bay, and again, especially if the Rams win that game, I'm choosing San Francisco. And that's not to say the 49ers can't win. That's not to say that they're not eight and two in their last 10 games. It's not to say that they haven't beat some really good teams along the way. It's not to say that they're not playing their best football of the season. They are, and they're going to be a tough team to beat. I'm not saying it's an easy out in any way, shape or form, but neither would have any of the other teams, not the Bengals, not the Titans, not the Rams, not the Cardinals, if it's them, certainly not the Bucks. Like this is, this is big boy football time. Like you better be ready to come and bring your A game for the next three weeks if you can make it that far, because nothing is going to be simple. And that goes for the 49ers as well. But to me, as you look at the 49ers, they have one major flaw, Jimmy Garoppolo. And we'll kind of get into, you know, more in just a moment as to, uh, uh, you know, keys to that game. And I'm not going to break it down in full capacity. You know, that'll be something I do throughout the course of the week. And as we get closer to that game, But the 49ers have a true weak spot in Jimmy Garoppolo where if he needs to go win you the game, you're not sure that he can. If he needs to make it so that he doesn't make a mistake that blows the game for you, you're not sure that he can. And you're, you know, he, he's just not, he's, you know, he's the worst quarterback remaining, regardless of what happens moving forward. He is the worst of the eight quarterbacks remaining, regardless of what happens with Rams Cardinals. I would take either Stafford or Kyler Murray over, over Jimmy Garoppolo. And it just is what it is. So again, in no way, shape, or form saying that this is going to be an easy game for Green Bay, but this is what, if you're in a must-win season, right? You're in an all-in season. I know that this is a must-win game. It's a playoff game. Every playoff game is a must-win game, right? But if you're in an all-in season and you get healthy at the right time, you're the number one overall seed. You have the MVP. You have arguably the greatest quarter or greatest wide receiver in the NFL. You have everything that you want to make a run you can't lose to the 49ers in this game. You can't lose to Jimmy Garoppolo and the San Francisco 49ers at home. Just can't happen. I'm not saying it won't. I'm not saying it can't. Like I'm not saying it like can't physically happen, but as a as an organization and as a franchise, this has got to be a, a game that you win by, you know, to me, you just win it, but win by 10 plus points. You're that much better. And it's time to play A plus knock them out football. And I think that's what Green Bay can do in this game. And again, we'll get into all of it as the week goes on. And I have a few, you know, points I want to talk about here. But as far as, you know, point spread and things like that, Green Bay opens as five and a half point favorites in this game. So as of right now, Vegas seems to like Green Bay. Again, as we mentioned earlier, the Packers won in week three, 30 to 28. Interestingly enough, that was really the the one game this season where Green Bay got off to a gangbuster start. You know, every other game, it's like they get behind by seven and then they go and they, you know, pick it up in the second and third quarter. And by the fourth quarter, they got a pretty easy margin of victory. The other team's trying to come back at the end. The 49ers was the exact opposite. It was really the antithesis of every game that they've played this year. The Packers opened with a 17-0 lead, a commanding lead, and then the 49ers make a comeback. The, The Packers gain a little bit more ground, and then the 49ers make a comeback right at the end. Uh, And then, of course, just left Aaron Rodgers a little too much time. He gets Green Bay in field goal range. Mason Crosby kicks the game-winning field goal, and the rest was history. So that was a fantastic game. But if you ask me, you know, if you're just looking at it, no, I think the 49ers are clearly playing better than they were at that point. I think Green Bay is playing much better than they were, specifically defensively, than they were at that point in the season as well. That was one of my lower-graded defensive games of the season. Um, Also, Green Bay at home this time instead of on the road. Don't have to make a West Coast trip this time around. And, you know, I think overall Green Bay is just going to be much more prepared. They're coming off of a bye week. And the 49ers, oh, by the way, will be playing their fourth road game in the last five weeks. So they have had a ton of travel on their schedule. This will be their third road game in a row. So once again, that, that can start to wear on you big time. Like you, one of the first things you look for when you look at the schedule when it gets released every year Do you have any three-game road trips? Because you know those are going to be incredibly difficult. Now, San Francisco hasn't had to, you know, travel. It was a West Coast game and then to Dallas, you know, so it's not like they had like this brutal travel schedule. And even Green Bay, it's not like that's like the, it's not going all the way East Coast, right? But three road games in a row and again, four of their last five. And you wonder how much injuries, fatigue, travel, and short rest is ultimately going to play a role here for the 49ers in this game. Again, Green Bay has some certain advantages there that they have going into this game, including extended rest, including getting all their guys back from injury. And of course, injuries are going to be the elephant in the room for the 49ers and certainly something that we should discuss right now. 
because two of their best players, and certainly their two best defensive players, in Fred Warner and Nick Bosa, both go out injured in that game. And let's just be real. Their availability in this game is paramount to the 49ers' chances at success. If there's no Bosa and Warner, I mean, Green Bay, Green Bay has to win that game. Like, they're, Green Bay has to win that game. That changes everything for the 49ers. And I'm not saying the 49ers can't, you know, whip up some crazy things and whatever, but those are two of the best defensive players in all of football. And if the 49ers are in any way, shape, or form, I know I say that a lot, but if they uh, are in any way missing that game, that is going to be a massive blow for the San Francisco 49ers. Now, let's let's talk Bosa first, right? This is a head injury. Now, it looked like a pretty bad head injury where his neck snaps back. It's diagnosed as a concussion. You wonder if there wasn't some sort of like neck injury there too, and you wonder how bad the concussion was. It wasn't like a forcible blow to the head, but man, those friendly fire shots are beyond brutal. And again, it's worth noting here that this is a Saturday night game. So the 49ers have one less game in between uh, that they have to prepare for this and to get healthy for this game. So that could be an impact on Warner and Bosa as well. However, with Bosa, if he is healthy, this isn't like an ankle or a leg injury or an arm injury, a bicep, something like that, where if all of a sudden he is able to play, you're wondering, all right, but is he himself, right? If Bosa is able to go, he's going to be Nick Bosa. I don't think the the you know concussion or head injury is going to be lingering where all of a sudden he can't get past people. So if he plays, you would expect him to look like Nick Bosa. Fred Warner, on the other hand, is quite a bit different. If this is any sort of a you know legitimate ankle injury that could linger, if he's even a half a step, a quarter of a step, fifth of a step, whatever you want to say it, slower than normal, that is a big deal for the 49ers. Their, you know, one of their keys is Warner's ability to get sideline to sideline, to make plays in the defensive backfield and coverage, uh, to get everywhere he needs to go, to make splash plays in the backfield when they use him as a blitzer. He is a all-around stud. He can do it all, but his agility and his mobility are a huge reason as to why. And I talk about this all the time. And it goes for the, the same for the Packers players returning from injury too. This isn't Madden. It's not, you know, well, if he's, you know, quite, you know, if he's questioned or if he's playing, he's a 99. And if he's not, you know, he's out. But if he plays hurt, like he's still a 99 in Madden, right? Like, the, the the rank doesn't change. By the way, NBA 2K does that better, where if somebody's hurt, they actually go down in grade a little bit, but I digress. But in Madden, like, right, if they're healthy, they have the same grade. It's not how it works in real life. Just because, you know, Nick Bosa or Fred Warner are out on the field um, and playing does not mean that they are up to their normal standards. So a lot of people sort of blowing this off and just saying like, I'm sure Warner and Bosa are going to play by the time Saturday rolls around. And that very well could be the case, but A, maybe not. And if either of them miss, that is a massive blow for the 49ers. And B, even if they do play, how close to 100% are they? And like I mentioned, I think Bosa, if he's healthy uh, enough to play, will probably look like Bosa. But I don't know that you can say the same about Warner. If he's at 75, 80%, even that, well, a big win for the 49ers and the fact that he'd be able to play, uh, a win for the Packers and the fact that you don't have to face a 100% healthy Fred Warner getting all around the field. And let me just be clear here. I'm not cheering for either of those guys to be out. I'm not cheering for either of them to be hurt or injured. I want everyone to be at their best. I would love Elton Jenkins in this game. I would love every 49er. Like to me, if we could, going back to a Madden reference, if we can turn injuries off for a year, I'm all for it. Let the best team win, right? And and I don't want I don't want any question about a, a Packers Super Bowl run, right? I don't want people to say, well, you know, it, you know, against the 49ers, they didn't have Bosa and Warner. And then they played the Buccaneers, but they didn't have Tristan Wirfs. And then, you know, they went to the Super Bowl and, you know, some chief or Titan or Bill or whomever got hurt and they didn't have him, you know, so the, the Packers have an asterisk next to their, like, go out and win their games because Green Bay is good enough to beat anyone on any given Sunday. And that's what I want to see. So, Here's hoping that Warner and Bosa are healthy for this game, but I do want to point out that if they're not, it is a massive, massive blow. And even if they're playing, again, if they're not 100%, that could be a big blow for the 49ers. 
All right, let's talk about a couple keys to this potential game. And again, I'm going to break this you know, much further down as we go on this week. Um, I'll have special guests on to talk about this as well. Uh, and certainly towards the end of the week, I'll break it down in a much greater capacity. Plan on spending some time on, on Monday, on today as you're listening to this, going back and watching Packers 49ers from week three, going back and looking at my grades and notes from that game. We'll get into all of it as the week goes on. But as I sit here and initially think about this game, the, the low-hanging fruit, right, is you have to make Jimmy Garoppolo beat you. This cannot be a game where Debo Samuel and Mitchell and you know anyone else, it just can't be anyone else. And if you're, it starts with Green Bay's offense, put up points. May, don't make this a 23-17 slugfest or a 2017 slugfest. I know it's cold. I know it's at Lambeau. I know you want to play some physical football too, but let's, you know, if you can get points on the board, and make Jimmy G have to match points with Aaron Rodgers, that's a victory for the Packers. Now, I still think Green Bay needs to run the football. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that they can go one-dimensional against the 49ers. I think that's a really bad idea. They need to have success with Jones and Dylan and play action and everything like that too. But if the, if the, if the Packers' offense is successful, their defense is going to be successful because that's going to put Jimmy Garoppolo in unadvantageous situations. It's going to allow that pass rush to get home. It's going to allow those corners to get you know, you know, hopefully make plays on the football. I love the prop bet of Razul Douglas with at least one interception this week. Just feels right, does it not? But that's that's the the first and foremost. You can't have a game where, you know, flashback to two years ago, NFC Championship, where Jimmy Garoppolo didn't even need to throw the football. And by the way, let me just put a stake in that theory right now. I don't care what anyone thinks about this Packers run defense. They're a lot better than you think they are. I, I have no fear that, you know, uh, of this Rams running game that they're like just all of a sudden going to run rough shot through this Packers run defense. I don't see it happening. Just don't. I think they're a lot better than people have given them credit for. Only allowed one running back over 100 yards all season long. And I just think that they are much more stout. And I think when they are healthy, which they are going to be in this game, and Kenny Clark's clogging the middle. Dean Lowry's playing a more physical brand of football than he has in a very long time. Slayton's looked better. Lancaster can plug the run inside. And then you've got all of a sudden, you know, potentially Rashawn and Preston and Zadarius and Merciless and all those guys along the edge. Green Bay has uh, some opportunities to play really good run defense. Devondre Campbell's going to be healthy in this game. Chris Barnes has been a much better run defender this year. They're going to be prepared for this 49ers offense, and they're going to be prepared to stop the run. I will be beyond shocked if the 49ers just all of a sudden run right through Green Bay. I'm not saying, you know, Elijah Mitchell can't get 100 yards. I'm not saying Debo Samuel can't create problems, but I have zero doubt that they can stop the run enough to make Jimmy Garoppolo beat them. And if that's the case, you know, get him off his spot, get him under pressure. I know that's not easy. You know, 49ers have a good offensive line. It's going to probably have to start from the interior because their tackles are really good, specifically Trent Williams. And I think, you know, if, if Z can play in this game and rush from inside, that could give Green Bay a big opportunity to get some pressure over the center and make Jimmy Garoppolo a bit more uncomfortable. But when push comes to shove, you have to make Jimmy Garoppolo beat you. I think you have to keep a really close eye and really game plan for Debo Samuel as well. George Kittle's a weapon. Uh, Brandon Ayuk showed some things. Jawan Jennings has been a really big uh, receiver for them on third downs as of late. So they have a variety of different ways. We know use check and so on and so forth. But Debo Samuel's their playmaker. And again, I'm giving you low-hanging fruit here. I get that. I'm not breaking any news here. But he has to be the guy that you you don't game plan for all week. That being said, I do think there comes a point where like, if you can shut everything else down, if you can contain Elijah Mitchell, if you can make sure that George Kittle is not going off for 100 plus, if you can contain the receivers on the outside with Jair potentially and everything else, I'm actually like, okay, like if, if Debo ends with like 150 yards in this game and everyone else is kept under wraps, I can live with that. You know, it's, there's always the unique concept of like, do you try to take out their, their best weapon or do you make their best weapon go for like, tr try to go for 300 yards and shut down everything else, knowing that they're probably not going to go for 300 yards. And this one, I'm not saying like, just let Debo run wild, right? Not in any way, shape, or form. They have to have a plan for him. So I want to be very clear there. Debo needs to be public enemy number one this week. But I also feel like also make sure that you're focusing on everything else because Debo is going to get his, right? He's, he's probably going to get 100. If I'm betting over under, I'm saying Debo is going to get 100 all-purpose yards in some way, shape, or form. 
keep saying that, I'm sorry, uh, this week. Um, but I, I'm okay with that if you can shut down everything else. And I think Green Bay can do that. I think they can shut down Ayuk. I think they can shut down Kittle to some extent. I think they can shut down Juszczyk and Elijah Mitchell. Keep everything else in check. I'm okay with Debo getting 100 yards if need be. All right, so what else is going to matter in this game? I think kicking, right? It took Green Bay a game-winning field goal to beat the 49ers last time. How would you feel right now if I told you that this game came down to a 51-yarder by Mason Crosby game on the line, down by two? Or down by one. I forget if they were down one or two last game. I think it was maybe down by one. But either way, down by one or two, game on the line, 51-yard field goal for Mason Crosby. And you know, obviously, this is a little bit different because it's going to be colder and a 50-yarder is going to be tough. But even I said like a 48-yarder, 46-yarder, right? That's you're not maybe feeling so great about that. And I think that's a huge key in this game is you can't have mistakes from the special teams in Mason Crosby. Meanwhile, Robbie Gold, as we heard, you know, through the broadcast has never missed a postseason field goal. So hopefully we can put that bad juju on Robbie Gold so that he's getting ready to miss his first playoff field goals. But overall, that is a big advantage right now. The 49ers are going to have full faith in Robbie Gold going into that game. And we know that that kicking operation has been really rough all season. It's going to be another one that the 49ers have an advantage on and is going to be worth keeping an eye on as we get closer to that game. Let's talk about the buy for a second, because I know there's also some trepidation of like, all right, the 49ers are really hot team right now. They've won eight of their last 10. And all of a sudden, Green Bay, they lost their last game. They're coming off of a bye. What if they don't have momentum, right? Well, kudos to Rachel Hotmeyer for putting together the statistics, our you know, Packaday's very own Rachel Hotmeyer. They are the Packers are three and one coming off a of first round bye since 2011, including, of course, a win against the Rams just last year. And they're six and one coming off a of bye in the last 25 years. I think this is one of those classic situations where like the, you know, the negative one like stands out to you more in your mind and you just think like you never want to see that happen again. Yeah. When they had the bye, you know, in what, 2011 and the Giants beat them, frustrating. That's going to be one that sticks in your mind. But overall, Packers in their last seven games of the last 25 years, six and one coming off that first round bye. So it has been an advantage for them more often than not. I know some people are worried about that. I have zero doubt that Green Bay is going to come out ready to play this game. I think they're going to be have a fresh set of momentum and just energy from guys coming back like Bakhtiari, like Jair, like Zedaria Smith. If anything, I'm almost worried that they come out a little bit too like overzealous. I think they almost might need to like calm things a little bit. But as I've mentioned before, and I'll say it again right now, I the the Packers are not the team that I would want to face at Lambeau Field with all these guys coming back. I, I think Green Bay is going to be a buzzsaw c- coming out of the gates. And I think the 49ers are going to have to temper that as best they can if they want a chance to win against the Packers. My early feel in this game, and you're probably getting the gist of it already, I like Green Bay a lot in this game. Now, when I say I like Green Bay a lot, that doesn't mean I like Green Bay by a lot in this game. I don't care if the Packers win by one or a hundred or anything in between as long as they win. But I do like Green Bay to win in this game. And I think again, we've talked all year about the, you know, how well this team has played, how well the talent stacks up. And I think for the first time, right, there's very few holes as Green Bay starts getting these injured players back from injury. You know, Darnell Savage has had some issues at times this season. We could still see some Shannon Sullivan who can get targeted from time to time. Chris Barnes, if he's in coverage, could get targeted from time to time. You know, Tyler Lancaster has some limitations if he has to, you know, try to cover out to the edge just athletically. But for the most part, this is going to be a defense that is revolving around Rashawn Gary, Preston Smith, Zadarius Smith, and Whitney Merciless likely or potentially along the edge with Kenny Clark, Dean Lowry, TJ Slayton, and potentially more Zadarius Smith inside. Tyler Lancaster on obvious rundowns, which is more than within his job description. Chris Barnes and, and uh, Devondre Campbell, who've played phenomenal at inside linebacker all year long. Eric Stokes, Razul Douglas, and Jair Alexander at corner, and Adrian Amos and Darnell Savage at safety. That is, There's no holes there. There's really not. There's going to be some plays here and there, but that's a phenomenal defense. And on the offensive side of the ball, MVP Aaron Rodgers, Dylan Jones as a tag team in the backfield. DeGuara, Daphne are playing great in that H-back role. Mercedes Lewis and Daphne both playing well at tight end right now. Alan Zard's playing his best football. Devontae Adams is Devontae Adams. Uh, you know, Randall Cobb is going to be coming back. 
And then you've got Bakhtiari at left tackle, Runyon at left guard. I don't care if it's Kelly or Billy Turner at right tackle. You know, yes, you know, you got Josh Myers coming back. I think the way that Josh Myers and Lucas Patrick play moving forward are, is going to be one of those other pieces to watch. But overall, everything's come together. And this has got to be a game, like I mentioned earlier, that against a, a 49ers team that's a little beat up, that's played a lot of road games, that has the worst quarterback of the remaining playoff teams. I like Green Bay in this game and I like them a lot. And again, that, may, that might mean that they only win by a point. I don't care. I just expect Green Bay to come out of this game with a win. And I think ultimately Green Bay has more ways to win this game than the 49ers do. I think if the 49ers get down and they have to have Jimmy throw the ball, I think that's going to be uh, you know, a real opportunity for the Packers to win. I know the 49ers came back last time and Jimmy G was a big part of that. I don't see that happening again. I don't see that happening at Lambeau. I don't see that happening the way Jimmy G is playing right now. If Green Bay gets behind, I still think they can come back and win. And if it's a close game, I like Green Bay's chances in that as well. So I think Green Bay has more avenues for success in this in this matchup ultimately. Uh, let's really quickly break down those other wild card games. I was certainly wrong yesterday. I thought the Eagles may have had a chance to keep it close, although I was correct in saying that Josh Sweat was a really big key to this game. No, not to say that Josh Sweat would have changed the outcome here. The, the Bucks just overmatched the Eagles in every way, shape, or form. Josh Sweat did not play. It would not have mattered. The Bucks outclassed the Eagles in every way, shape, or form. That's number three, sorry. And uh, yeah, I think uh, you know the Eagles basically seem like they came with a, a college offense against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and good Good luck with that. And then the other game, Chiefs blast the Steelers as well as expected. I know there was a lot of talk about that 2-7 game. And of the you know those two two seven games, Bucks and Chiefs over Eagles and Steelers by a combined score of 73 to 36. And by the way, it wasn't anywhere near close to 73 to 36. Both the Steelers and uh, the Eagles got some garbage time stuff. Both those games were absolute blowouts. I know there's some talk about the two seven seed game, you know, maybe not mattering or watering the, down the playoffs. I don't think anyone was really like, you know, bummed out about those games prior to them happening, right? And I guarantee you, over time, there's going to be some good two seven matchups. I guarantee there's going to be some upsets over time, and it wasn't this year, right? And it happened to be that those two seeds were Patrick Mahomes and Tom Brady. That's that's pretty darn good and pretty tough opponents to go against on the road. It's not always going to be the case. And I think we're going to see better games than that moving forward. And while I think ultimately it maybe waters things down a little bit and does a disservice to the number two seeded team, let's not make light of the fact that what this is also doing is making the number one seed that much more valuable. So while you're adding games to the regular season and putting it at 17 and probably eventually 18 games, that one seed should become more valuable. When you are the best team over a 17 and 18 game season, you shouldn't have to play a 17. You might say, well, Andy, does it even matter if you get the two seed, you're going against a team that you have a chance to blow it anyway? Sure you do, but guess what? Tristan Wirfs and Ryan Jensen got beat up in that game for the Buccaneers. You know, So you have to go through that and play that and you get more wear and tear. And it's more opportunities for those sort of things. So by not getting the one seed, you're putting yourself at more risk to potentially lose players that are going to help you win a Super Bowl. So I do think to some extent that while those games weren't great, I do think they will be in the future. It's not like I wasn't looking forward to Eagles, Bucks, and, and Steelers, Chiefs to see if maybe you do get an upset in one of those games. And I think ultimately it does provide value for the number one seed. So I don't hate it. I know it didn't work out this year, uh, but overall, I think it's something that will still be a value because of what it can do to the number one seed and, and valuing that moving forward. As far as Rams Cardinals, uh, I'm going Rams in that one. Cardinals wouldn't shock me, but I'm going to go Rams. And I think we get a very good Rams Buccaneers game, but we'll see what happens on Monday night football. Vikings finished their interview with Nathaniel Hackett. So that is done. He is now interviewed with both the Vikings and the Bears amongst others. I think Jacksonville and Denver are done if memory serves, but I know there's at least four that he's completed. Meanwhile, the Bears are set to interview Reggie McKenzie for their GM opening. Now, first of all, if you haven't read the article over on The Athletic yet about the dysfunction with the Chicago Bears, I very much recommend doing so because it just gives you such a great juxtaposition of what's going on in Green Bay and how Green Bay's handled everything. Also go back and listen to the beginning of my conversation with Mike Wall of how so many of these teams are just poisonous atmospheres and poor cultures. You get a great insight into what's going on in Chicago, so I highly recommend that. But of all the interviews, GM and head coach for Minnesota and Chicago, Reggie McKenzie is the first one that's caught my attention to be like, that would give me some cause for long-term concern in Chicago. Now they would have to give him autonomy, unlike he got with the Raiders, and they need to give him time. 
but Reggie McKenzie is a, a brilliant football mind who has the ability to put together a long-term program in Chicago. And that would give me some, you know, again, cause for concern as a, as a Packer fan. So be mindful of that as, as they move forward. And hopefully the, you know, as a Packer fan, the bears are not smart enough to bring in Reggie McKenzie, but for, for Reggie, uh, I hope he gets an opportunity somewhere as a GM this year because he, you know he would do wonders for some team if given the, the full autonomy to run that and not have John Gruden and everyone else trying to make decisions around him. All right, as far as uh, playoff matchups, you got Bengals Titans at 3:30 next week. You got 49ers Packers at 7:15. You got either the Cardinals or the Rams at Tampa Bay at 2 p.m. on Sunday, and then you wrap things up with Bills at Chiefs in a really marquee game that I cannot wait for at 5:30 p.m. next Sunday. That is going to do it for the wild card or the divisional round next week. That is going to do it for me today. Thank you so incredibly much for joining me. Always appreciate you. I will be right back here tomorrow uh, on the video version of the podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, we'll have a great show lined up for you on the audio version. Make sure to subscribe to either if you have not already. I would greatly appreciate that. Like and comment below or you know, make a comment, a uh, five-star review if you're listening to the audio version. Always appreciate those and they mean more than you know. But more than anything, thanks for listening. Always appreciate you. We are getting closer to the divisional round. Packers 49ers, I absolutely cannot wait. I will see you guys tomorrow here on the YouTube show. But until next time, and as always, Go Pack Go!